Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known football fans and high-profile figures talk about the first ever match they attended. I'm your host, Richard Foster, and it's an absolute pleasure to introduce today's guest, Kevin Day. Kevin has had quite a career moving from HR to becoming a stand-up comedian before gravitating to becoming a writer for TV shows such as Have I Got News For You, A League Of Their Own, etc. He also made regular appearances on Match of the Day too, so you might recognise his face from there. And he's also written a couple of books, but let's face it, who hasn't written a couple of books? <laughs> uh, nowadays, <laughs> along with Kieran Maguire, who is as a matter of coincidence, is going to be on this pod in the next couple of days. He hosts the Price of Football podcast, which he describes as bafflingly successful, <laughs> a point to which some podcasts aspire to, <laughs> but not this one. Uh, most importantly, amongst all these details, Kevin is a Crystal Palace fan. So as a man, of not only of great taste, but with an excellent understanding how football works at every level. Uh, so, Kevin, welcome. I'm chuffed to have you finally here as a Palace fan on the show. Between you and me, we've had a bit of riffraff in here. We've had Arsenal. Oh, my we've Lord. We've had Forest. We've even had a Man United fan. But at oh. last, we, we can relax in the luxuriance of having two Palace fans on this pod. Um, and I can't wait to get stuck into your, your first ever game, which, mm. let's face it, amazingly, was a Palace victory. Well, it was a Palace victory, but it was a Palace victory that led to relegation and then subsequent relegation. So it's it's fairly typical that I chose to become a Palace fan at the time <laughs> of our least success. Um, yeah, it's, it's good to be talking to another Palace fan, Richard, but yeah, it's slightly ruined by the fact that your next guest, Kieran, is a Brighton fan. So I mean, yes. you've been, you've plumbed the depths with Forrest and Manu, but having having Kieran on is, and uh, I should point out as well, it's the, it's such a long time since I was in HR that it wasn't even called HR then. It was it was P, it was personnel. Personnel, yeah, yeah. 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 You knew where you stood yeah. in those days. Yeah, my first game. <laughs> it's an interesting one, Richard, because when you when you pitched the idea at me, I'm sure I mentioned to you that there's the the first game I officially remember. And this is what I tell people was my first game was was February the seventeenth, nineteen seventy three, at home to Stoke City. But I know, I I know, or at least I was told that, that I'd been to Palace. I must have been to Palace games before because I, I I became a Palace fan on my first day at primary school when I sat next to this kid who's still my best friend, who whose mum had knitted him a Palace jumper, which I thought was the coolest thing going. So mm -hmm. it, it, it can't have been six years before I went to my first Palace. And my dad says he took me to um, Palace Man United, our first game back in, or our first ever game in Division One in, in 1969, mm -hmm. which I have no memory of, considering that Best, Charlton and Law played in that game. And then George Best was my idol. I'm fairly certain I, I would remember being there. And I know that the greengrocer, claim that he'd taken me to see Palace play Chelsea, although why the greengrocer would close on a Saturday afternoon to take a random child to a football <laughs> match, I don't know. I, I'm yeah. fairly... Yeah, Steve, my best mate, is fairly certain I've been to a, a couple of games with him and his dad. Uh, I, I do know that I went to a Wimbledon game as a, as a five-year-old, which my Uncle Bill took me to, um, which I remember as a... A strange experience because he was a spiritualist medium oh. and would, would stop every now and again to have a chat with somebody that I I couldn't see. But I so I, I clearly had been to football, but this this is the first this is the first game that I have clear, vivid memories of going to. Um and it it, it was a win. Um it was well, it's, it's strange. It, it's always the same thing. I, I've, when people ask you, I've been asked this question before, they, they say, well, what, what are your memories of the first game? And, and mm -hmm. my answer is the same as so many other people's memory. I, I say, well, we had a black and white TV. So my first memory is how vividly green the pitch was. But that's, with hindsight, that's slightly odd because I lived two minutes away from Tootingbeck Common. So I was quite used to the mm -hmm. idea of green and grass. 
that wasn't a new concept. And as somebody pointed out to me recently, as every Palace fan of a certain age listening to this will know, that by February, which is when this game was, Sellers Park wasn't green. I mean, no. it was, it was, and I, I, I managed to find the game on YouTube, and there were patches of green near the corner flags, but the rest of it was, was, was sheer mud. So that can't have been my my memory. And then, and then I say to people, well, of course I remember the grown ups swearing, but. That can't be right either, because as as Barry Cryer once described my mother as swearing like a docker's parrot. My mum, my mum, my mum was <laughs> Irish. And she, my mum swore a lot, so again, that can't be, that can't be right as well. So, I I really, I I, I know I went to get. I think my abiding memory was the kit. It was the oh, well. it was it was we had that all white kit with the claret and blue stripe down the front. But by this time, the claret and blue stripe was was separated a little bit. Yeah. And the badge was on the wrong side, if you like, on one of the stripes. So I'm, I remember the, the kit. And also Don Rogers, I, I particularly remember Don Rogers, who became my first ever Palace idol. He's still one of my Palace heroes, but he was my first ever idol. He scored one of his uh, traditional slaloming dribbles through mm-hmm. the mud, lifted it over the keeper. I remember that. And, but I also remember at the end of the game being – vividly impressed by the fact that his kit was just as white at the end of the game as it was at the start. And he was, he was just, if you were to describe a 70s footballer, or if you asked somebody to draw a, an early 70s footballer, it would be, it would be Don Rogers. And it, he had this fantastic Mexican style shaggy hair and this massive moustache. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he, comedy fans. He looks a bit like Michael Redmond for comedy, who made played a priest, played a gloomy <laughs> priest in Father Ted. But uh, yeah, uh, I've never, I've never really thought about that analogy. But yeah, I think you. But, you, I, but the I, I, is there. I remember getting to meet Don Rogers. He's one of the first players I ever met when I was sort of in my early twenties, and I got introduced to him, and he he just went. He said, "I know you're, why you're smiling," and I went, "I'm Don. I'm really sorry." He said, it's the accent, isn't it? I said, Don, I'm, I'm really sorry. Because he, he, he just had himself this, he looked like an Arctic type, but he had this preposterous West Country accent, yeah. which I, I presume was Swindon, which is where he was he was from. Is it Famously, he was from Swindon and he had a sports shop. That's what everyone knows about Don Rogers. But I, I, I was starstruck when I met him as he was, but what a football. I mean, you, you don't get players of that sort anymore, just out and out wingers basically his job is to to hug the touchline get the ball put across in and occasionally drift in and, and just so so that's my that's my abiding memory is him leaving the also the other thing as well I was thinking about I was when I watched it on YouTube just to remind me of of, of the game mm. is how it, there was more green in the stands than there was on the pitch because every single kid had a parker on so like that famous scene from when Hereth beat Newcastle and the thousands of urchins yeah. with Parkers. Every <laughs> single kid in the crowd was wearing a Parker. So there was far more green off the pitch than than on it. Absolutely. And um, you're right. I've looked at that video and it is, you're right. It's generally basically brown all yeah. the way through the middle, but sprinklings of sand, which I thought was quite a nice idea. There is a sprinkling of sand. And then, as you say, right on the edge, you've got little tufts of grass, not really anything you'd... You, you wouldn't get lambs frolicking on it. But Don <laughs> Rogers, as you pointed out, I, I did look up a little uh, piece they did with Don Rogers. And he said he was given two instructions by Burnhead. He said, keep your left leg on the left touchline and also take him on. And that, oh. that was all the instruction, you know. Wow. You know, if, if you're looking at the Guardiola's, the Klopp's of this world, you, you need to understand how this works. This is quite complex, you know. It's not about playing a false yeah. nine and pivots. This is keep your left leg on the left touchline, take, take him on. on. And, and one of the other things you point out, he did look like a Mexican bandito, but he was born in Somerset, actually, so that he was even oh, okay, further right. west, right. even further west than Swindon. So therefore, the slight uh, West Country brogue. Hope we're not putting any West Country people off here. Um, but apparently, he shaved his moustache off once, and his wife cried for two days afterwards. Oh, really? 
So that's that is. I think you know when your wife cries for two days that it's probably a mistake and you should not do that again. And he kept his moustache forevermore. And going back, actually, to, I, I think we need to dig quite deep into Don Rogers here. I've had David Squires, the Guardian cartoonist, on this podcast, and he's a Swindon fan, but he started watching Swindon after Don Rogers had finished, right. uh, had left, left Swindon. And he said to me, uh, after we'd finished the pod and we'd gone on for an hour and a bit, he went, the one thing I really missed is we should have done Don Rogers. And I'm really glad now we can talk about Don Rogers because obviously he came to prominence with Swindon. He scored when they beat Arsenal famously in the League League Cup Cup, final. And I also want to refer back to your description, which I think is absolutely perfect, of Don Rogers slaloming. Because that's what he... I've never seen another footballer do that. He just jinked in and out. It was amazing. Like, you know... I'm not a massive ski fan, but when you see those guys go down the gates, that's what they're doing, aren't they? They're doing slalom or they're going downhill. These guys, he was slaloming. He, maybe the white, you know, the pristine kit again it is extraordinary because you see every other player is just spattered in mud. Yeah. And there he is. It looks like he's just got it out of the bloody washing machine. It's incredible. Yeah. So he must have had an amazing sense of balance and never got brought down. So... Don Rogers, I'm with you totally on on that. And I think he would have probably been one of my first Palace heroes as well. Well, we've always had, uh, I mean, wide players. I mean, we uh, we went on mm. to have Pete, Peter Taylor, yeah. uh, Vince Hilaire, Wilf Zahar, Yannick Balassi. We've always had cracking wide players. But the, the thing with, and you know, Arsenal, by the way, tried to get that League Cup final postponed because they had a huge bout of food poisoning. Um, yeah. And the, the Football League just wouldn't allow them to do so so but the thing with Don Rogers when you see it again and I, I I didn't have any memory of the ball at the time but you look you you wonder what a player like Don Rogers would do with modern balls because you see the ball watching that game back on YouTube I mean I don't think they could have I don't think there was only more than one ball in the ground it was and it looked like a ball that had been used all season it was like a proper yeah. Sunday league ball and those balls yeah, you know, without sounding like our own parents or grandparents when they talk about, you know, Stanley Matthews could cross the ball so the laces faced away from the, the header. Yeah, but those yeah. balls, the, we know from experience, those balls were were heavy. And what he managed to oh, do yeah. with them was it was incredible. And that it's it's when you think of of old football, it's always Don Rogers that comes to mind. Don Rogers and George Best, I think, are the two, me, the most striking images of, of football when... I first started. So I don't think you. I don't think you were ever more obsessed with football than you are between the age of eight and and thirteen. As I think, yeah. at, 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 when when you fall in love with, because at that age, you know you could have thrown me any club in in England, Scotland, Wales, or on the continent. I would have told you their manager. I would have told you their kit. I would have told you their badge. I would have told you their nickname. There's there's nothing more. And and whereas in in life. I'm not particularly nostalgic. I think in general things are much better than when we were younger. And I think that goes for football too. But I think every football fan has a particular period that they look back with with great affection. And that and for me that that was that the period that started in 1973, which is ironic, because again, we as I say, we got relegated that year. Malcolm Allison came in and we got relegated again. But we also had the kit change. We also had the nickname change. Mm-hmm. We also had the badge. The badge went on the sleeve, and then in the middle of the shirt, we yeah we had. Remember, Malcolm Allison gave the players nicknames, so they were the, the players were announced the nicknames. So number two is the card sharp, which is Paddy Mulligan. <laughs> we, we we had we had a groundsman who'd uh, uh, what, what, he he'd taken the wheels off a of Volkswagen. And put, right. a, and Len put a, Chatterton, Len, Len Chatterton, and so he'd and he'd put rollers on the front of this, and they called it the flatterer. So that would come driving on at half time. So <laughs> as a 12, 13 year old kid, you, you kind of don't. All these things are really, really exciting, and, and and also we're talking about a time. You know, you mentioned the price of football. The one thing we've learned from the price of football is how football dominates the game, and in, increasingly now, and how. Well, this season, lawyers are dominating the game as much as anything else. Mm. 
But we've also learned what a disaster relegation is from the Premier League. Whereas when we started watching football as a kid, it, it, it kind of it was it was upsetting. You didn't want to get relegated. Yeah. You didn't want to be in Division Three, but it didn't make it didn't make any real difference. It didn't make any difference to the you know, we. In fact, our 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 crowds were just as big in Division Three as they were in the first division. And of course, that's when I first started going to away games. And there was mm-hmm. nothing more exciting than because we would take three, four thousand to places like Northampton or or, or yeah, Shrewsbury, yeah. which is really exciting. So they were they were the times that I I look back on is my formative years, and, and that and that game against Stoke had had, had kind of everything you'd want from seventies football. A referee who wasn't going to pull a yellow card out for, no matter what happened. There's one particular scramble in that game, which I, which I again I don't remember from the time, but watching it on YouTube, which takes place between the penalty spot and the and the, the semicircle and the, the edge of the box, in which I, I think there's probably four red card offences, six <laughs> yellow card offences, none of which the players moan about, none of which the referee's going to do anything about. It's got it's got goals, it's got dribbling, it's got shirts with numbers that have clearly been sewn on the back. It's got it's got everything you want for your your rose coloured glasses view of seventies football basically. Exactly, and to go back to the detail because uh, I don't think I've spoken to anyone on this podcast. I doubt whether I will who has got a crystal clear memory of their first game because it would be weird. Yes, and yeah. you've got you know you you've got to build up the the myths. You've got to get to the point where you say actually. Uh, I can only remember one of the people who scored and I can hardly remember the other team. That's fine, but we we build it up. So actually, Rogers' goal was the third Palace goal that day. It was. Third. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. the other two scorers on that day? I, 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 it was Whittle. I think it was Whittle and Posse. It was. I, I, it was. I think, because... Yeah. Um, Oddly enough, I, I was I had to do some filming at Leighton Orient a couple of days ago, and it just reminded me of the days when that's where every single London footballer went to die back yeah, in, yeah. in the, so they all ended their career at Orient because J- John Jackson, our goalkeeper, finished yeah, his yeah. career there. Derek Posse finished his career there. Alan Whittle, yeah. um, we spent a lot of money on Alan Whittle, I think, because he mm. came from Everton with a, a good reputation. He was one of those players. At the time, the, the tabloids would go, well, this is a strange one for me. So I do, it's, it's interesting what you say about building up the myths that surround your own myths and history. Because mm. when I came to interviewing friends for my first book, which was a history of every, every all 92 football clubs, it's sort of yeah. left wing, light hearted. But when I it's, came it's to. It's over my shoulder. I, I know, I could see it. I'm very. I'm you very can pleased. see it. You, you can I, tell I, the boy. Yes, yeah, so, but, um, Every spine you can see a mile off. But but it's really strange because I I, I I I took my closest mates, the ones I've been going to the palace with for many many years, uh, and we all went to the Porson's Arms one night during uh, during the summer, and all these cherished memories that I had of various games were completely at odds with their own memories of the same game. Even to the extent there's there's one. Game away at Cardiff when you know this particular train journey, and we got threatened by policemen, and you know, and they all went, "No, that didn't happen. No, the, the the policeman incident was another game. That train story wasn't. No, hang on a second. Of course it was, but in in the end, you kind of go, it doesn't matter really. It's just like you stick with yeah. the version. And also, every time you tell a story, you find yourself adding another detail. Anyway, you 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 embellish it. Is like I I said to you before we started the particular set of circumstances that meant I, I couldn't get my ticket to get into Bournemouth. I, I was in Bournemouth. I was outside the ground, but I couldn't get in because of various Nazi stewards and so on and so forth. But by the time I'd got home, the story had already grown in the telling in my own mind. And and this time next year, it will be a full, full-blown full 10-minute stand-up routine. Cause, but that's how it is with all of the, all of our memories of, of, of different games. But it, it's interesting that I... I think the Don Rogers goal stood out because Don Rogers became my hero, and also because that that season I think he scored two in the same game against Everton, really similar goals. Mm-hmm. And I think one of them was either goal of the season or goal of the month, and that was a period as well. We didn't win many games, but we tended to score really 
spets like John Hughes against Sheffield United, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then we beat Man United 5 0 the season, yeah. the season before. So we had these occasional breakout moments, but I don't. And it, it, it was interesting watching the Posse and Whittle goals, which I think Whittles was in like a header from eight yards. Mm hmm. Uh, and it's really interesting. So your immediate instinct now is to go, hang on a second, can we can we check that for for offside? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, there's, there's very few action replays when you see the old YouTube. But the other thing that did stick out watching, because there, there was one true Palace legend of, of of who played in that team, which was John Jackson, mm -hmm. who, was, who had the misfortune to be a fantastic goalkeeper at the same time as Shilton and Clements yeah. were. Uh, were around. If those two hadn't been around, Jackson probably would have got a hundred caps for mm. England. But it's that's the that's the biggest thing. The first thing is you you kind of go you see a back pass. I remember watching an old Palace game with Ed, my son, who's twenty eight. Uh, the, the big match revisit it just happened to be on. Mm. We were watching this game and, and and he was like, "Oh my god, was that what it used to look like?" So go and he went, "Hang on a second, he's, he's just passed the ball back. What's the keepers picked up a <laughs> yeah, keepers picked yeah, yeah. up a back pass and they couldn't but." And it, it's, the keeper's got no luck because my my dad. I remember watching a game with my dad and Peter Bonetti. It's a Chelsea game. Peter Bonetti had gloves, and my dad was like, "That's it. I'm not going to football again." It's just like he's horrified by the fact that this person had gloves on. But you look yeah. at you look at John Jackson. The state of this pitch. He's got his shorts pulled up really high, no gloves. Happily throwing himself at the feet of people. Cause it, it, the other thing, they all look. I remember meeting Jim Cannon, who was our centre half for many, many mm -hmm. years, and and he was the same height as me. And you think, hang on a second, you were six foot four, and you because because in your head as a <laughs> yeah, kid, you think, you think all these players are, uh, and that, uh, which in a way is why it's always academic when people say, we you know, the, the 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 best Palace team ever. You would say the, the ninety the Palace team of nineteen ninety. Would they beat the Palace team now? No, of course yeah. they wouldn't, because yeah. they're they're not as fit, they're not as strong. And so those arguments are all academic, but in in your head, of course, you build up. You, th you think, well, our centre backs are huge, our our, our centre forwards. So Alan Whittle can't have been more than five foot ten, and he was pretty much playing as a centre forward. Yeah, and he actually mentioned size, and that's another thing. When I looked at the lineup, so you've got Alan Whittle, who's as you say, he's probably five foot four. Derek Posse, he wasn't very big. No. Then we had a guy called Bobby Bell. Yeah, again, in the back. Yeah. Totally it was like it's like the Oompa Loompas were playing. Yeah, and uh, Wigan well, was... scores a header, which I'm sure we didn't score many because he was so small. Yeah. Um, you know, for you with your Irish ancestry, you, you you were obviously delighted that Mulligan crossed it in for uh, Alan Whittle to score. Well, he and scored... I'm sure we did that many times. It, well, Mulligan scored. Uh... Two goals against Man United as well from, he did, from yeah, right back. the first two, I think. Yeah, yeah and, and I I think for a long time, obviously, as like you say, I'm half Irish, although I chose to support uh, when I chose to support Palace, I chose to support England as my national team because mm -hmm. at the age of five, you don't fully realise the socio political economic uh, <laughs> consequences of that decision in a in a family no. of in a family that's half Republican Irish. So, so, but Mulligan, I think for years was our most caps. He, he got thirteen caps for the Ooh. Republic, and I think, I think until about nineteen ninety five, he was the most capped Palace player of all time with those thirteen caps. But he was, um, he was ahead of his time because, uh, again, when you think back to football of those days, the formations are very rigid in in yeah. your head because most teams played uh, for a straightforward four four two. And the the fullback's job was really was totally defensive. It wasn't to go, whereas Mulligan was a was a very very attacking mm. fullback, which was unusual in those days. Derek Posse was an interesting one because not only was he little, but he always looked like he would rather be somewhere else. He used to wear he used to wear long sleeve he used to wear long sleeve shirts, but he used to grip yeah. he used to grip the bottom of his shirts like a toddler would do sometimes. And he yeah. just looked like, he, he, even in the middle of August, he looked like he was cold. Uh, yeah. And the, the ball would come to him and he looked like, oh, God, really? And it's not. It, it's just, it, it's, they're probably terrible footballers when you think back on it, but they were, they're your idols at the time. These were the people whose who's cards you collected and whose who's pictures in shoot magazine you cut out and put on your wall. Because to us, they were 
highly highly toned, fully fit athletes, weren't they? Of course they were. I think Posse was poss possibly suffering from PTSD, having been a Millwall. So, yeah, you know, it's it's a tough thing to get over, and m many don't do it. Actually. Well, it was. It, I mean, you say that, but it was considered highly unusual at the time for Millwall to sell somebody to yeah. Palace. Yeah, and, yeah. and and Palace used it as a, as kind of PR. Look, of course he's coming to the biggest club in in South East London, which is the sort of thing we clung to in those days. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's, it's not much of a competition, it's, is it? But, it's yeah, not really. We, we were the number ones, definitely. Well, do you remember and, we, and, we, we we took yeah, part? We took part for about three seasons in something called the Kent Cup, which was us, Charlton, Maidstone, and Gillingham. It was a pre-season tournament. It's still in our trophy cabinet now, which is rather okay. embarrassing because we yeah. won it. We won it once. And it's it stands out in our trophy <laughs> cabinet because, as wow. we know, somebody with an allergy to silver could happily spend a night in our trophy cabinet without breaking out <laughs> into any sort of rash, basically. But. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned, you know, Rogers' goal actually it was voted goal of the season. Was so it? I, I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Brian Moore. Was, there's a lovely clip, actually, if you watch the goal of the season on the big map. So they used to have, I think it was something like 10 goals, which is too many, possibly. But they sort of le led up to the big decision. Stan Bowles, actually, sadly departed recently, yeah. was in second position after scoring a great goal against Cardiff. But Don Rogers, that weaving, slaloming run and then a little dink over the kit, that was, that was goal of the season. But the beauty, you, you've got to have a look at this video. The beauty of the video is they then haul Jimmy Hill in front of the cameras to justify why they've chosen Don Rogers. Oh, okay. And Jimmy Hill is in a sort of paisley green shirt with a weird tie. And he's saying, well, the reason we did this, because he showed great skill and he also got a one-two with Alan Whittle in the middle of the pitch. So therefore it was fine. And he, he had to justify the whole of the 10 uh -huh. in that row. D doesn't happen anymore, does it? They just go, that's the goal of the season. Now you get on with it. Well, also, unfortunately, because the goal, the goals are voted for by the public now, aren't they? So yeah. Liverpool, Liverpool, Man U, Arsenal goals are always going to beat Palace goals, to be perfect. I'm still... I'm still sulking that Andros Townsend's goal against Man City wasn't the match of the day's goal of the season. That that uh, yeah, I know. The, the Vincent, Vincent companies. It's Brian Moore. It's interesting as much as uh, one of the great privileges of my life, as you mentioned, was doing match of the day two for 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 eleven seasons. Cause to, to be associated with the match of the day brand was incredible for somebody like me who grew up loving it, but even more than match of the day. And I think a lot of fans will tell you this. They they loved the match of the day, but they loved their own regional Sunday programs mm -hmm. even oh, yeah. more. And and for me, the big match was the one that excited me more than anything else. And and of course, in those days, you didn't know whether your game was going to be on telly. You only knew when you turned up at the ground and you saw the camera. You thought, oh my God, we're on match big match tomorrow. And yeah. it, it it's one of my greatest regrets that I never got to meet Brian Moore because he was the voice of of London football, this really dapper, bald chap, uh, Gillingham fan. Mm -hmm. And for me, he, he, you know, like when I talk about not being nostalgic and I'm not, but Brian Moore is the voice of my, of my football child. And by all accounts, a wonderful man, uh, a, a wonderful journalist who regretted to his dying day in that penalty shootout when he said quickly, Kevin, is he going to score as Batty yeah. stepped up to miss? But you just, he, his passion and his enthusiasm. And I always got the feeling that he liked going to Palace. He always seemed to say good things about about Palace. Even even at the end of that game on the YouTube, he says, this is one of the best games I've seen at Sellers Park. We always get great football here at Sellers Park, which was contrary to our... But I also love the fact, I mean, people outside London won't remember this, but the fact that at Christmas, their idea of a Christmas special was getting Peter Taylor, who played for us at the time, to do his Norman Wisdom Impression every time, yeah, every yeah. every time. But, it, but also, I remember because they would have letters each week from from fans. Fans would write letters in and say, "Oh, could you show us um, a footballer who looks like he's dancing?" And they would show this little <laughs> motto. But they would read out the full name and address of the people that that sent the letter. So it was like they would say, "This this letter's from um, uh, Brian Murphy. He's age nine. Mm -hmm. 
He lives at number two, Colchester Close, SW16, the four <laughs> PY. His parents are out yeah. between the time the hours of two. <laughs> but it's it's but Brian, I just I just love Brian Moore, even that that theme tune of the big match, even more than the match of the day theme tune, is the is the one that represents the starting point of football for me, if you like, the, the excitement of... And also, of course, you were much likely, as a Palace fan, you were much likely, more likely to see Palace on the big match than you were... Yeah. Again, this, this, God rest his soul, my dad was a very calm, placid man for the most part, but it would get at furious about the least important things. And every time Watford were on the big match, he would get absolutely... They're not <laughs> London. What are they doing on a London... I said, well, it's all... <laughs> I said, I don't care where they are. They're not London. Uh, well, he's right, actually. He exactly. was right because it's a half yeah. shirt. You know, it's not a yeah. postcode that's a London postcode. But Absolutely. let's not go there. No. Let's not go there. Um, well, interesting you mentioned the kit because, you know, one thing Palace have been pretty good at, not necessarily football, because, as you say, this was relegation followed by another relegation, but our kits have been pretty much outstanding, certainly through this period. Um, you know, Alison changed it to the red and blues and then to the red and blue sash. And it, they do stand out. And, and I did tell you uh, before this, I was going to get you a programme for the match. I don't know if you collected programmes. But unfortunately, when I first did it, I, I bought the wrong programme because this oh. is actually... I remember From that the one. the previous season. Yeah. So it's Palace Stoke. Uh, I don't quite know. I don't think that is John Jackson. He certainly wouldn't be smiling as the ball went past Look about him. But um, that was, that, can I just the, point out as well, that's a very, people can't see it at home, but yeah. only only Palace that season. So it's a, it's a light blue programme cover. It, we do have a video version, so oh, we do. Oh, fine, okay, but it's there, yeah. it's it's a picture of a, a goalkeeper, a ball going past a goalkeeper, yeah, which clearly basically. it just sets it just sends a negative message. It's not even a photograph; it's a cartoon. <laughs> it sends a very, sends a very negative message, but it, possibly yes. You're you're talking about kits, the Palace. I, I I do get nostalgic for Palace kits. I have to say, I will talk about Palace kits happily, and and I will. Although it's interesting because. <laughs> Again, I don't want to open that can of worms because you know some Palace fans listening to this are absolutely furious about Steve Parrish's notion that we are actually founded, in, that we are the club from 1862. Yes, yes. Uh, that, that wore light blue and white half kit because uh, many Palace fans won't simply won't have that. As far as they're concerned, it's 1905 and that's the end of the story. And as yeah. they point out, if, for Steve Parrish to claim we're actually... 40 years older just means we've gone even longer without winning a major a major trophy but <laughs> of yeah, course from, work. from from 1905 for the first sort of 30 years of our career we wore the Aston Villa kit because uh, yeah. our, our first manager stroke secretary um came down from Aston Villa with a basket full of kit so we wore their their colors for ages but then even back in the 30s and 40s we started to get a bit a bit tasty. And then in, in the early 60s, we had a white kit with the, the red and blue sash and a brilliant uh, badge on top. And and then we started to get, f for me, if, if I ever, I'd have to win several lotteries, but if I ever got into a situation where I took over Crystal Palace Football Club, the first thing I would do is change our kit back to the 1969 one. Because for me, there's never been a better kit in the world ever than Claret with light blue stripes and the yellow a yellow collar that that kit was just a thing of beauty for me and then, and then we got a bit we got a bit fancy didn't we in the years after that snazzy like, snazzy bit, i think it's the word snazzy, yeah well do you know as as well though and this is heresy to say that the white kit with the red and blue sash is not my favorite kit i like really? i like the light blue one with the red sash we used to have but that that white kit with the red and blue, it didn't it didn't the red and blue stripes i thought was one, I love that, and and the fact that the, the fact that Malcolm Allison had to sheer chutzpah to take our kit from Barcelona and our nickname from Benfica, yeah, when when we were in Division Three, was <laughs> was it? But the attention we got as a Division Three club when Allison was was my, my dad's favourite time as a Palace fan, bar none, was when Malcolm Allison was, was manager, even though we went down twice, twice. under him, yeah. 
but he he did put us on the map, it, albeit in some dubious ways by inviting topless models into the bath and and mm. and, and outraging a way. I, I met him once, uh, shortly before he became ill with with Alzheimer's, and he was the most fascinating man. He, even even then, he was getting on a bit, but he was still fully in control of his faculties and just listening to him talk about his ideas of football. But I, I, I said to him, I said, do you remember you know, that marvellous cup run we had in, in 76 as a third division team when we got to the semi-final? The most scared I've ever been in my life was I was at the away game at Leeds when we beat Leeds yeah, on the yeah, yeah. and Leeds was still one of the top three clubs in the in the country. Uh, we beat them one 0 and I was terrified. It was a terrifying experience as a as a uh, 14, 15 year old kid. And I said to Malcolm Allison, I was, did it occur to you that when you were doing that thing when you walked around the pitch, smoking <laughs> smoking a cigar, wearing a fedora hat? Sticking pointing, to, going one nil, the pointing, yes. the point, doing gestures with the score. Did you, it occur to you that we had to get home? Because <laughs> it, it, so, you did it everywhere. You did it at Sunderland. You did it at Chelsea. Yeah, yeah. He said, "No, I never thought about that." I said, "Well, you should have done because these places, <laughs> these places are in, intimidating enough as it was without this cockney in a fedora going around it, it's winding them up." Yeah. Yeah. So Malcolm Olsen, I mean, I don't think many f- fans of Clubs would celebrate a, pl- a manager who took took us down twice, but then again, there was that FA Cup run. It did put us into the limelight. One of the few third division sides to reach the semi final, as you say, beat Leeds away, who were pretty good. We beat Chelsea away. Yeah. They weren't that great, but we beat them and the Pete Taylor free kick. We beat Sunderland away in the you know. The quarter final that was actually an Alan Whittle goal as well. Yeah. Um, so quite a few of these players who played this day in your first game were, you know, I, I mean Whittle's one of them. I don't actually know how many more would have been involved. Probably not that many. So do we? No, Whittle's probably the only one. I mean, we had uh, uh, Mel Bly, I think Mel Blythe was still with us, wasn't he? For the was he still? Yeah, yeah. I possibly. think I think Mel Blythe was still centre back for the. For the cup run, but the rest I think had got Hinch- Hinchwood would still have been there. I think Martin Hinchwood Martin was playing Hinchwood. in yeah. the Stoke game. Yeah, uh, but obviously um, Doris, as he's clearly known, <laughs> would have been there. Um, so it's interesting looking again at the team. So we've been through. We've got a lot of it. Jackson, absolute club stalwart, three hundred odd appearances there for ten years. Mulligan, as you say, ahead of his time. Yeah. Tony Taylor, Ian Phillip, you know, Scottish, ginger hair. He did all what Scots people should do. Bobby Bell is just a nice name, isn't it? I yeah, mean, it's a lovely name, yeah. Don't think he's that great a player, but yeah. Mel Blythe was, again, a stalwart yeah. centre-back. Derek Posse. But we had Charlie Cook play for us. It's, do you know what? I, I thought... It's weird. I thought Charlie Cook had... Because, again, uh, we, we had Charlie Cook... And we had Bobby Tambling at one stage, who were Chelsea yeah, we legends. Yeah, Chelsea. Who were, yeah. who were che- but Chelsea legends, these players. So when they came to yeah, yeah. I, I thought in my head, before I looked up the the team for that day, that I, I thought that Charlie Cook had, had long gone, that he was still there. Yeah. But it, it, was, it was interesting because um, Philip and Cook were like hangovers of the seasons before because Bert Head, our manager, who was also mm. from the, the West Country, was our manager, who looked like... Um, a snooker umpire. He was probably only about forty, <laughs> but he looked in in the same way that you're you're astonished when you grow up to discover that Ted Heath and Harold Wilson were only in their late forties when they were prime minister yeah. because they looked like old men. It, it's the same with Bert Head, who used to wear a blazer uh, and a and a tie. With a, but it, it, you remember for for two seasons, he basically did all his shopping in Scotland. So there was one mm. Palace there. I think that's the team that beat Sheffield United with John Hughes up front. I think that had nine Scottish players in. Yeah. So yeah. By, by this time, that yeah, yeah. But by so by this time, uh, I think Philip and Charlie Cook. But Charlie Cook was um, a huge figure. I mean, he was he, he would have been far more famous than Don Rogers was. And and oh, yeah. Charlie Charlie Cook was a was a player when you when you see a, a old stuff of Charlie Cook. Playing in his in his prime, which was slightly before he came to Palace, I have to say, 
very similar player to Don Rogers as as Bobby Tamley were players that would try and take people on, but but Charlie Cook was just completely overshadowed by Don Rogers in that in that Palace team. As I say, to the extent that I, I, it came as a surprise when I looked up the team and and realised that he was actually still in it. And also, Charlie Cook tried to carry off the bandito moustache. Just didn't didn't, make didn't, it. didn't work. You know, I meant to say... Just the, looked like a West London dandy, didn't he? The, the last time I saw... Well, they're all that, that whole Chelsea team when they were just literally West London dandies, weren't they? But they took Leeds United on in a scrap, which was something oh. that my dad always liked. But I, the last time I met Don Rogers, by the way, which is only about five or six years ago, he looks exactly mm. the same, except the hair and the moustache are now absolutely snow white. And he, he said it virtually happened overnight. So he went from this, he, and he, he, he's, he's still got the accent as well. It just made me laugh. <laughs> and he's still got the sports shop as well. Still got the sports shop. He's, well, he had then, I think he may have retired by now, but it, 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 it's strange how that stood out that he had a sports shop because most footballers had pubs if they had anything. Yeah. But, but he, he wanted to keep, he kept the sports shop on because it was something to fall back on when he, when he finished playing football. You can, can you imagine explaining that? To a to a player now, imagine saying to even to Jordan Ayew, say, "What do you thought about having a sport in case this all goes wrong somewhere? <laughs> when it gets to a sports shop or a tropical fish shop, just to something to fall back on, you know?" Because uh, again, and I'm, I I don't say this with any you know everything was better back then because it wasn't, but those were days when footballers still didn't earn that much money than. A, a, a decent manual labourer, really. If, no, if, if, you, if you look at old programmes, which you are all want to do a, a, when you reach a certain age, it's yeah. it's interesting how many of them, they, they're posing happily outside their small semi-detached houses with their Ford Cortina, which half the people in the crowd would have had houses the same size and car, the, the same car, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they had... Um... You know, in those profiles, always like, where, where's your favourite place to visit? It, yeah. it was either Mallorca yeah. or probably the Costa del Sol, but it didn't yeah. get very much fun. I mean, America would have been a real stretch, but, you know, Dubai clearly wasn't even probably invented by it. Yeah. But, you know, these things have massively moved, and I think we're allowed a bit of nostalgia because, oh, you know, they're, yeah. they're great. They're, some of them are just lovely. And talking about I think so. Sorry to interrupt. There's a couple of times in, in pro. I remember, I can't remember which Palace player it was, but it's somebody we just signed in the, in the early 80s. Uh, when, of course, they did, some, they did player transfers, the bet that, you know, a player would walk onto the pitch at half time and sign yes. his, his contract. <laughs> and and you'd, you'd go, oh, wow, he looks good, didn't he? Look at the way he's gripped that pen. I, mean, if, I don't even if remember that. I, 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 it turns out this may be a false memory, but I'm convinced it happened, and I'm convinced I've seen a photograph of it. Because if you remember, our, our chairman for the, in the late '60s, early '70s was was Raymond Bloy, who mm -hmm. made his money by being uh, the accountant to a large wholesale meat import and export company. And I swear that this happened that we signed a player on the pitch once, and there was half a cow carcass hanging yeah. next to him. Because I'm sh I'm sure that the Croydon advertiser had, to, had this photograph in the thing. But I remember we signed this player, and in, 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 in the, 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 the player profile of the first programme of the season, it was like favourite place to visit, and he said Florida. And I distinctly remember going, oh, he's been to Florida. He must, <laughs> yeah. he must, he must be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's taking his, his skills abroad. Yeah. Um, now, the reason, you know, Bert Head, as you say, I think snook, snooker referee is probably pretty good, accurate description. He did also have quite a massive head, which is good for a guy called Bert it, Head. It, it, yeah. Yeah, he... Um, Isn't it? He, he, uh, managers were such a... I, I, it's really interesting what you say that Don Rogers said about his instructions, mm. because it 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 seemed then that, that being the manager of because we've grown up, of course, or not grown up with, but in more recent years, we all know about sports science, not so much with Palace because yeah. Roy Hodgson was very suspicious of the whole idea of <laughs> the, what People he called players the, fit and all that. What, sort of he, what he called yeah the so called sports scientists, but. 
it, it, it seemed in those days that the club consisted of a manager, uh, the trainer, whose job was to come on in a tracksuit with a towel around his neck and, and splash yeah. water on someone's face, and the reserve team coach, who nine times out of ten was an old punch-drunk player who mm. had, had, had such a bad limp he would make circles in the carpet. But that seemed to be the whole structure of the club. That seemed to be all you had. And you were kind of at a loss for what the the manager sort of did during the week yeah, because, because all because all teams all teams pretty much played the same the same. I mean, occasionally you'd see a, 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 a European Cup game, and one mm. of the fancy down foreign teams would be playing a a libero or a sweeper, and you'd go, oh "My God, what's that?" Yeah, and, <laughs> but, but English football, it was very much two teams cancelling each other out. Um, Diet. There's no. I mean, famously, it's a terrible cliche, isn't it? Every every footballer's pre-match meal seemed to be steak and chips, and that was certainly their favourite meal was steak and chips. So you you did wonder what he did, but I mean, he kept us in the first division for for four years. Yeah, whilst, just, yeah. As you say, it never actually got. He did have a big head. He did have a, yeah, he did have a giant head. So uh, maybe he had a huge head for that, you know. For his brain capacity and being able to think beyond yeah. the book and get Mulligan running down here, maybe yeah, and keeping that... Rogers' left foot on the left touch line. That's, that's a, yeah. where it all came from. Now I think of it, I can't think of him now without think, picturing Frank Sidebottom in my mind. That's, <laughs> that's how that's how big. But yeah. also, do you know, we 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 apart from people like Malcolm Allison who broke the mold, yeah. we rarely heard from we rarely heard from managers. In those days, no, no, it, was exactly. very, yeah. it was very unusual, even, even on the big match or, or match of the day, they very rarely interviewed a manager afterwards. They would occasionally interview a, a, a player or a, a yeah. captain. But, and you certainly didn't have, I, I think Brian Clough was another exception. Brian Clough realised the the financial benefit that could be accrued uh, in brown envelopes mm. by doing various media appearances. And we heard a lot from him. But for the most part, you, I, I don't think I could tell you what, what Bert Head sounded like, you, and you, you certainly wouldn't. They, what, whatever they did say wasn't poured over by a, a no, des no, no, no. desperate media trying to keep twenty-four hour news cycles going. Mm. I mean, it's actually a common theme. People have raised this. So Darren Fletcher, the commentator, raised that very issue. Said he can't really understand for a start. You know, certain modern managers who are on the edge of their box all the time haranguing their players. Yeah. Um, you spent the whole week training these guys. They're pretty good. You don't need to harangue them. You can just yeah. let them get on with it. Okay, pop in the odd word if it's not very well. But you don't need the 100 minutes of continuous haranguing and saying, come on, come on, come on, what are you doing? Oh, what are you doing? So, I think I think that's for the cameras, Richard, because if, yeah. if, if you talk to most footballers, and you ask them about that, they will say, we can't hear him. Yeah, of course. We haven't got a clue what he's saying. We can see him pointing, but you don't know whether he's pointing at us to go somewhere else. Or you, you, it, I think a lot of it is because football fans expect to see that level of energy now from a manager. They want to see them get going. Yeah, you, yeah. you see how pleased fans are when their manager gets a yellow card. They think that's yeah. fantastic because it shows he cares. It's a badge of honour. It's, it's a, a badge, badge of honour, of course. It shows he cares. But <laughs> again, imagine saying to somebody... Uh, at that Palace Stoke game in 1973, that there will come a time, you know, when the, the managers are not allowed. Because you managers would, I don't, throughout, I, I don't think I ever saw Bert Head get off the bench. They just, managers just sat on the bench, didn't they? You, yeah. you, you saw their feet sticking out and that was about it. You, you didn't they, have that little demarcation, yeah. you know, the, what we have the rectangle yeah. now. Which, and for, surely, like Eddie Howe jump up and oh. down like they're a puppet. Surely the worst job in football is for being a fourth official, oh. isn't it? Because they all think they should be the ref anyway, but all they're doing is standing there being sworn yeah. at. And what's uh. the advantage? Where's where are the benefits? You know, saying, "Oh, I'm listening to some really enlightened managers taking yeah. the rip out of me and trying to, you know, yeah. basically wrench my my uh, head from my shoulder." I'm going to go and get something for you, which I'm again nostalgia. Hang on. All right, that sounds intriguing. <laughs> 